Well, now, warm welcome to you on this last occasion of being together. Uh, it's great to see you all through these days. It would be helpful, just for my sort of little computerized uh, mind, to find out how many people for whom this has been the first word alive. Give a show of hands for those who are here for the first time. Okay, hands down. Those who, this is your second time at Word Alive. And here are the real, the real tough guys, the ones who've managed three. Give them a big hand, they need it. Thank you very much. What I will not do is have you show your hands if you're going to come next year, because you'd all put your hands up on that one, I'm quite sure. One or two notices on this last uh, gathering. The ICC stall is open for the sale of tapes, 11.15 to 12. But if you've forgotten to get your tapes, or you decide you want to get this morning's tape at the last minute you want to dash there, make sure you get there between 11.15 and 12. We realise you may have some delays in getting off the site. That doesn't surprise you. Please be patient. Need I say that? At the end of a week like this, one of the great qualities you will all exhibit will be patience. And on the road home, you'll tell people how much you love them and all the rest. <laughs> Who knows? But to avoid queues as far as possible, please would everyone turn left as they drive. We'll also drive on the left, that also helps. But when you <laughs> turn left as you drive off the site, it may add slightly to your journey. You may be going in the wrong direction completely, but it will help us. So there you are. Will you please <laughs> turn left when you drive off the site? Actually, that was meant seriously, but you will seriously consider it. If you are on our mailing list, we'll send you a copy of the Word Alive brochure for next year. To make sure, please complete the slip on today's Harvest News and hand it in at Moonshiners or post it to the Spring Harvest Office. Now, it is uh, obviously right and proper and uh, joyful thing to do to say thank you. It's always a problem when you're saying thank you because at the end of the day, a lot of people, we, want, we who arrange this Word Alive want to thank you for coming. If you didn't come, there'd be no point in having a Word Alive. So we thank you for coming. But together, I'm going to go through a list fairly quickly, but that doesn't mean to say we're doing it uh, superficially. And then at the end, we'll give a, a big round of applause. If you stop, if everyone sort of, sort of applauds their favourite lot, we shall be in trouble. So wait till the end, will you please? We do want to say thank you to all the people involved in admin, in admin support, the cashiers who've looked after all the money, for those who've hosted us, who've produced thousands of cups of coffee and the rest, for the sound and light people, the stewards uh, who we've been nice to at least one day and I hope all the days, who've done a terrific job, the TV crew, always on. <laughs> There's nothing worse than when you're giving a notice, you don't know what they're laughing at, never mind, okay. <laughs> I'm sure it was worth it. <laughs> then in a different group, let's, we, we, we give thanks to the arts and entertainment people, those in the arts pavilion, the Harvest Sound who've made sure you could watch in your chalet, the Harvest News who've produced day by day, and I don't know how they do it so quickly, and those involved in the service area, very patient people who've done a terrific job all the week. We're grateful to those who've worked pastoral and helped people. I know there are people here today who want to thank God for the ministry of the pastoral team. I know from one or two stories I've heard, there are those who will go away this week all different, not partly because of the work of the platform, mostly because of the work of the Spirit of God, but very much because of the caring ministry of the pastoral team. For those who've helped with the mentally handicapped and that ministry, we are grateful. We're very grateful to those, most of them are not here, who've been looking after the under fives. If ever I have a, a pay a tribute, it's to those who look after the under fives. Now, I think that is ministry marvellous. We thank God for those. For those who looked after the work amongst the children, the young people and the students, and of course for all those who have been involved in leading our worship, our musicians, we, do, we are grateful uh, for the work that they do and for all uh, who have been helping uh, day by day and night by night. Those who have ministered God's word, we, we do it because the Lord has called us to it. It's a great privilege. We want to thank those who've shared in that ministry. 
and I personally am very grateful uh, for, uh, to Steve and Bob who shared with me in this ministry here in leading in worship. May I give one last final word of thanks, and I shall not be thanked by him for saying it, but I do want to say a very special thanks to Roy Clements, who was the chairman, has been the chairman of the Word Alive committee until now. Uh, much of Word Alive was due to his inspiration and vision and his chairmanship. When you're getting together groups of three groups of people coming from uh, different backgrounds, four groups of people, uh, well, it isn't always easy chairing. He's done a tremendous job. He's continuing on the committee, but he's asked to stand down as chairman, and, and they've asked me to be the chairman for the next session, and uh, I'm willing to do that, happy to do that. But I want you, uh, as we applaud all these people, very special to thank God for Roy's inspiration and for all that he's meant to us. And so for all these people, we give thanks. We thank God for uh, speaking to us through his word during this week. And one of the ways we can thank God uh, is by putting into practice what he's taught us about himself. And of course, we can praise and adore his name in corporate worship as well as in the changed life as we go back. I wonder what we have learnt this week in seminars or Bible readings or evening meetings, or, or wherever we've been in personal conversation. I wonder if you just think for a moment about something you've learnt this week, or you've been reminded of in a fairly stark way. And I want you to take just a minute to, in a moment, share with someone next to you, or in front of you, or behind you, that one thing you've learnt, and what you're grateful for about the Word Alive week. So while that's happening, a number of you have asked me if we can have a repeat performance of Lift Up Your Heads. And so I know this is going to be news to the choir, but I said yes. <laughs> so while you're sharing for a minute each what you've learnt, the choir will begin to make their way forward. Please do that now.
Okay, if you could uh, finish sharing. No, no, don't, don't step down. You're more attractive than I am these days. <laughs> they don't need to see me, they just need to hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've been able to share some good things that you've learned this week. We're going to move now into a time when we thank God for what we've learned, not simply by saying what we have learned, but by praising him. And when the choir have finished, we're going to have an opportunity congregationally to continue that praise of our great God. We're ever so grateful, as I said last night, to Chris and the choir, and they're now going to lead us in our praise as they sing to us. Thank you. He is the King of glory. This Jesus came to earth, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died a cruel death for our salvation, and on the third day rose from the dead. 
this same Jesus will one day return. He is our coming king as well as our present king. From the earth to the cross, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. We stand together and sing number 77. This morning we praise you for your son. We thank you that he came freely and willingly as a man here to earth, that he gave himself to a life of teaching and miracle and encouragement and fulfilled his destiny by dying dying in my place, condemned in my place, bearing in his own body all my sin and guilt and dirt and shame, destroying the power of death, defeating the work of Satan, and on the third day, rising again, alive forevermore. And Father, thank you that your Son will come back into space and time, at the grand climax of human history, that he is our reigning King and our coming King. Thank you that he came from heaven to earth, from earth to that awful cross, 
from the grave to the sky. And one day from those skies to take all his own people to be with himself. How we worship and adore you, living, powerful Lord. Amen. Number 38 in your songbook. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is the Lord who has won this victory over the evil one, and so we bow our knees before him. We bow our knees now, but the day is coming when every knee will bow, and every tongue confess on every man and woman and child on the planet. Every knee will bow and confess that this Jesus is Lord. That's how great our Lord is. Number 38, great is the Lord. So we praise our glorious Lord and we're going to sing one more song before Roy Clements comes to bring God's word to us this morning. Roy is the pastor of a Baptist church in Cambridge and uh, many of you will have heard him during the course of this week, uh, if not in other conference settings and we're delighted he's here to bring the closing message of Word Alive 1995. And in preparation for that, we'll remain standing and sing number 85, a song which focuses on the first coming of Jesus, his incarnation, and that it came in both meekness and majesty, the human element, the divine 
element both combined perfectly in the Son of God. And that's a t tremendous mystery. So we bow down and worship in the face of this mystery, for this is our God. Number 85. Well, can I just add my thanks to you for being uh, here with us and making Word Alive possible. Word Alive does mean a lot to me personally and to my wife Jane, and uh, uh, without you, it couldn't come to pass. Please pray for it, and please do come back and support it again in years to come. We've been looking at some sections of the Gospel of Matthew in the big top here each evening, and it's one more section from that Gospel we're going to turn to for our concluding Bible study. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, with the theme, Be Ready for His Coming. We're going to look at the famous parable of the ten virgins, which occupies verses 1 to 13 of Matthew 25. Let me read it to you. Matthew 25, verse 1. So let's hear God's word together. 
At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. I don't know if any of you here come from Chester, but if you do, maybe you know that in your cathedral in Chester there is a clock with a uh, little motto, a little rhyme adorning it. It goes like this. When, as a child, I laughed and wept, time crept. When, as a youth, I dreamt and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. Later, as I older grew, time flew. Soon I shall find, while traveling on, time gone. It's a morbid little rhyme, isn't it? Just right for people like me in their midlife crisis. <laughs> but it is true, isn't it? As the years go by, the flux of time seems to get faster and faster. Our watches assure us that we are being born towards the future at a constant rate of 60 minutes in every hour, but it doesn't feel like that. Psychologically, at least, its progress definitely accelerates. That's true for us as individuals. The slow meandering of childhood turns into the rushing torrent of adulthood. Someone has said the most frightening thing about middle age is the speed with which you outgrow it. <laughs> the names of old friends start getting crossed out of our address book. The, the candles start costing more than the cake every birthday. Soon I shall find, while traveling on, time gone. But it's not just true for us as individuals, is it? It's true also for us as societies. Change seems to become more rapid, too, as progress advances in a society. Some of us here, some of the senior citizens amongst us, I expect can mem remember a time when an automobile was a rarity and an aeroplane was a sensation. Now we hear an aeroplane overhead and we turn our ears from it, it causes us no second uh, glance. And we should think nothing of getting into our cars in a little while to drive home. If the 20th century has brought such momentous transformations to the way we live, dare we imagine what the 21st century is going to bring? Mark Twain, you know, the author, told a class of school children in the late 1880s, Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. But you boys and girls will see more change in the next 50 years than Methuselah saw in his entire lifetime. And of course his prediction proved true. The 20th century has seen extraordinary change. His words are just as relevant today. The only difference being you don't need 50 years now 
to be disturbed by the rapidity of change. A decade will do. Such a prospect brings a peculiar form of anxiety. The psychologist uh, Carl Jung warned in the uh, last book he wrote, we have plunged down a cataract of progress which sweeps us into the future with ever wilder violence the further it takes us from our roots. And Alvin Toffler, taking his cue from those words of Jung, spelt out that same danger uh, in an influential book of the 1970s, Future Shock. He says, our galloping technology introduces change so rapidly the human psyche experiences a dizzying disorientation. We rocket society into an environment so ephemeral and unfamiliar as to threaten millions with a massive adaptational breakdown. I think he's right about that. Uh, I suppose it's always been the case that uh, uh, those of us who are a little older feel out of tune with modernity. We talk about the good old days when things were so much better than they are now. I suppose in any progressive society, the young will always feel more at home in the contemporary world than those whose formative years belong to an earlier generation. But it seems to me that sense of alienation from the present moment is setting in earlier and earlier as the years go by. People start feeling nostalgic about the past, not in their 60s any longer, but in their 30s. And yet it seems to me that even teenagers are demonstrating a kind of interest in the music and the culture of earlier decades, as if, as if even they want to haul back on the reins of time somehow and slow down its headlong charge. But I guess it's the uncertainty, the uncertainty of this speed of change that disturbs us most. We human beings need a secure environment. And this rapidly changing future threatens our security. Not just because it's so different, but because it's so unknown. If only we could feel sure about what the future would bring, then maybe we could face it with a great deal more equanimity. All kinds of predictions and forecasts are being made today, of course. Everybody from government think tanks to science fiction authors is making predictions, but the trouble is nobody really knows. Will the greenhouse effect melt the ice cap and drown us all? Will the hole in the ozone layer expand and incinerate us all? Will some third world potentate get a nuclear missile and nuke us all? As Arthur Clarke, uh, the author of the film 2000, uh, said, nobody, no age, has shown more interest in the future than ours. Which he says is ironic, since we may not have one. More and more urgently, the question of human destiny is pressing itself upon our consciousness at the end of the, of the 20th century. Where is this remorseless river of time taking us? Do you remember that? Uh, musical of a few years ago, Paint Your Wagon. There was a song in it that went like this. Where am I going? I don't know. When will I get there? I ain't certain. I only know that I am on my way. It would be a good signature tune for late 20th century people. It's just how we feel. It isn't a wandering star so much our civilization is born under as a shooting star. And we don't know where it's going to land. Where is the river of time taking us? As we get closer to the year 2000, more and more people are going to be asking that question around us. When you get near the end of a century, and particularly when you get near the end of a millennium, people get more and more anxious about the future. And we Christians, we have an answer. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom, says Jesus. So we Christians then see history as a journey, not a meandering journey to nowhere, a journey to meet the bridegroom. An Eastern wedding, you know, was a long affair, and unlike our weddings, it was the woman who was kept waiting. 
when all the preparations were made, the bride would wait at her father's house for the bridegroom to come and claim her and bear her off to the wedding hall of feasting. While she was in her father's house, vigil was kept by her unmarried companions, the bridesmaids, as we would call them. There was a kind of mischievous tradition which meant that the bridegroom would always try to arrive at an unexpected moment and catch them unawares. Invariably, he came at night after his stag party. <laughs> so the bridesmaids had to keep vigil very carefully. It was not safe or proper for a young woman to be on the streets alone at night without a torch. So it was vital too that they kept their lamps burning. So that's the picture Jesus is giving us here of the period of history through which we are presently living. The bridegroom is coming. The wedding is prepared. History is not a directionless meandering, as we just said. A day is coming, a moment, an hour, when Christ himself will return and claim the church as his bride. And then the Father's banquet will begin. The whole universe is holding its breath, waiting for that climactic moment. Jesus says that to be in the kingdom of heaven means to live with the taste of that moment in your mouth. It's to be part of that vigil, waiting the bridegroom's coming. A Christian is somebody who is uh, longing for his appearing, waiting for God's Son to come from heaven, lifting up their eyes to the future and saying, even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. And it's the purpose of this parable, you see, to impress upon us the importance of that future orientation. Be prepared, Jesus is saying. You must be ready. Keep watch. To be ready for that day is the very essence of wisdom. To be unprepared for it is the very epitome of folly. And some will not be prepared. Five of the bridesmaids were foolish and five were wise, he tells us. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. First thing I want you to notice there is the implication that the bridegroom's coming will at least seem to the impatient bridesmaids as if it is delayed. He was a long time coming. Sometimes you'll hear the idea from scholars, certainly, that Jesus expected the end of the world in his own lifetime. Well, the truth of the matter is, of course, that by his own mouth he declared he did not know when the second coming would be. You can see that back in chapter 24, verse 36. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. But clearly he saw there was a danger that his people would grow careless and negligent because his return was not as soon as they were expecting it. Peter, in his second letter, warns of exactly the same thing, doesn't he? Scoffers will come, he says in the last days, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Don't ignore this fact, he says. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is a single day. The Lord is not slow about his promise. The day of the Lord will come. I guess for some of us, 2,000 years seems a very long time. How long does it seem to God, I wonder? How long was it from the promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed and the day when in Christ that blessing came true. Do you know how long it was? 2,000 years, more or less. But that promise was fulfilled, for God's watch keeps perfect time. Beware lest the vast dimensions of his timetable make you complacent or skeptical. It will seem, Jesus anticipates, as though the bridegroom is a long time coming, but you must keep watch. And that's the second thing I want you to notice about the story. When the bridegroom did come, he was unexpected by all. You notice that? They all became drowsy and fell asleep, both the wise and the foolish. Now, isn't that an odd aspect of the story? Wouldn't you have expected, perhaps, that Jesus would have made the wise keep awake in the story? 
Surely that would have served his purpose better. They were being more vigilant. But no, you see, Jesus is convinced that the day of his coming will surprise not only the unprepared, but also those who are ready. Keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour, he says. And he says it to his disciples, not to the world. So important we should take notice of that. Some Christians have always been determined to interpret the so-called signs of Christ's return as if they constituted some kind of countdown that enabled you to predict the date, if not exactly, then at least fairly closely. There is, of course, a fascination in the thought that God has somehow given us secret information in the Bible, inside knowledge about when the Lord's return will be. And so down through church history, there have always been Christians eager to play those well-known parlor games, uh, count the earthquake, spot the antichrist. <laughs> what so many miss as they play those games is what Jesus was really getting at, you see, back at, uh, in, in chapter 24. The very chapter that talks about the signs of the end of the age. Just look at what prompted Jesus giving that information, the signs of the end. In 24 verse 3, he's sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples come to him privately. Notice that. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? That is the end of the age. And what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? They want the inside information, you see. Give us the lowdown, Jesus. You can tell us. I know you can't tell everybody, but... You know, we're your friends, we're your mates. Let us in on the secret. When's it going to be? And do you notice his immediate response to that request for special inside information? Verse 4, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. It's as if he knows this area of interpreting the signs of the end is going to be an area where his disciples will easily get led astray. People will very quickly jump to the conclusion, his return is absolutely imminent. And the fact is, there's still a long while to go. He drums that in, in the way he talks to them. You see, in, uh, in verse 5, Many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and, you, uh, and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars. You can almost see the twelve, can't you? Jotting it down in their notebooks. Wars and rumours of wars, got that? Yes. False Christ, yes, got that, good. See to it you are not alarmed, he goes on. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Ah, tear that page out and screw it or throw it away. That's not much use. Then he goes on again, you see. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Oh, great, earthquakes, international intrigue, earthquakes and famines. Right, we've got it all. All these are the beginning of the birth pain. See what he's saying? Wars and earthquakes and false prophets and persecutions. The temptation would always be when these things come upon the church to assume this is it. Things can't get any worse. This has to be the dawn of the end. But every time that kind of climate of political or economic uncertainty arrives and Adventist hysteria proliferates in the church, it will be a mistake, he says. And isn't that the way things have progressed? People were sure it was going to be the end of the world, but as Jesus anticipated, it proved only to be the beginnings of the troubles. These things must and will happen. We mustn't uh, get excited, we mustn't be shaken, we mustn't be disturbed, he says. Such things will continue and worse things will happen before the end comes. Every catastrophe, every war, every false Christ, is meant to remind us the days are short. But Jesus says quite firmly, when the real day does dawn, you nor anybody else will not have worked it out in advance. You will not be expecting it. You will not have got advance warning to enable you to get specially ready. It will be a time when nobody, unbeliever or believer, expects. Keep watch, he says. You do not know the day or the hour. The difference between the wise and the foolish was not that one had got the inside information about the bridegroom's time of arrival that enabled them to set their alarm clocks, was it? No, the difference was that one group adopted a stance of permanent 
habitual readiness. They made sure they had Duracell batteries in their torches. Whereas the others allowed themselves to lapse into negligence, unpreparedness, they all slumbered and slept. They were caught on the wrong foot. And with disastrous results, for the cry went up, he's coming. He's coming. Here's the bridegroom, verse 6. At midnight, the cry rang out, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us. And you, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. It does make you feel so very foolish, doesn't it, to be caught unprepared. It's a lovely story told of the making of one of Cecil B. de Milne's great epic movies. The film team were on location in a very hot part of the Middle Eastern desert. Uh, de Milne had set up his uh, crew on a hill overlooking a huge valley. A great battle was staged in the valley with thousands and thousands of cavalry and footmen and what so on coming from all directions. The scene was gonna cost thousands and thousands of pounds to set up. So de Milne, to make quite sure he caught the action, had three cameras to film it. One low on the hillside, one further up halfway, and one perched right on the very top of the distant mountain. Well, the clapperboard sounded, and he calls for motion, and the whole valley erupts with carefully staged hostility. After a few moments, he calls out to the, uh, to, uh, the action to stop, and he yells to cameraman number one, did you get it? Oh, sorry, Mr. DeMilne, comes back the reply. The camera jammed. He sighs heavily and turns quickly to camera number two. Did you get it? Mr. De Milne, I'm so sorry, the film broke. De Milne, in a, in a fury of agitation, grabs the loud halo and bellows up to cameraman number three. Now, cameraman number three has been up on the top of that mountain a long while waiting for all this action. <laughs> it's quiet up there and warm. <laughs> Jerked suddenly into wakefulness by his producer, by his director's voice, he quickly raises a thumb. Ready when you are, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> but it was too late, you see. He was ready, but he was ready too late. That was the tragedy of these foolish bridesmaids. It was not that they didn't want to welcome the bridegroom. They thought they were waiting for that very purpose. These foolish virgins don't seem to represent to me the maliciously anti-Christian, the opposers of Christ. No, they represent those who think they are Christians, waiting for the kingdom of God, and in many respects giving every appearance of being Christians. And yet, there is a distinction between them and the wise, you see. A distinction that has happened turned out to be sufficient to make the difference between them entering the marriage feast and being shut out. And the distinction was simply this. The wise were ready on time, and the foolish were ready too late. The wise had resources that endured the long waiting period. The foolish burned out before the bridegroom's arrival. You'll find scholars try to identify what this oil in the story specifically means. Some identify it with good works, some with the Holy Spirit, some with divine grace. I think those sorts of attempts try too much to make the parable into an allegory and rise, raise all sorts of tortuous theological problems if you follow them too far. Now, oil here is simply a symbol of Christian perseverance. That was a point, actually, Jesus was making again back in chapter 24, verse 12. Because wickedness is multiplied, he says, men's love will grow cold. 
but he who endures to the end will be saved. It's a great text for the last day of Word Alive, isn't it? He who endures to the end will be saved. And this story in Matthew 25 of the wise and foolish virgins is a, is a sobering illustration of that truth. It is the mark of a true child of God that they persevere. Their lamps do not go out, even though the wait is long, even though there are hardships on the way. They endure to the end. Whereas some begin the vigil, but fail to make it. At the last, they are not ready. There was no deep root within them. Their oil ran out. How does Jesus put it? They woke up, trimmed their lamps, but the foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Some people you know will tell us that when Christ returns, we shall have a second chance. Perhaps during the millennium or in purgatory or something. I don't see any hint of that here, do you? When the bridegroom comes, opportunity to find grace is ended. Do you see the pathetic desperation of these foolish girls? Our oil is run out. Give us some of yours. How many? How many? We'll seek entry to the kingdom of heaven on somebody else's passport like that. Oh, my parents were Christians, says one. You can't inherit the Holy Ghost. You must have oil of your own. Oh, I have lots of friends who are Christians. I belong to the church. I've been baptized. Remember Lot's wife? Her body belonged to the people of God in a sense. But her heart belonged to the world. And when the judgment of God fell, it was her heart it tested. She had no oil of her own. Christian families and Christian friends, Christian fellowships, they are a great blessing to us. But we must have oil of our own. Jesus' story assures us the means of grace is there. There are plenty of supplies in the shops. In these days before the Lord's return, there is time to seek the Lord and find his mercy, time to repent and believe, time to experience his spirit in our lives. But the time will come when that opportunity will be gone. You know, the ancient Greeks used to liken opportunity to a fleet-footed runner. He had hair on the front, but none at the back. The point being that if you didn't seize him when he was running towards you, once he'd gone by, there was nothing to hang on to. So says Jesus, these foolish bridesmaids needed to have taken action while they had the opportunity. But they didn't. So their desperation turns to separation. The bridegroom came and they went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward, the other maidens also came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, better late than never. Please come in. Is that what he says? Well, many would like him to have said that. Who can't understand the appeal of universalism? The idea that everybody's going to get saved in the end. I remember a student telling me in Cambridge once, very solemnly, oh, my God would never send anyone to hell. Which is quite true. Her God wouldn't send anyone to hell. Her God wouldn't harm a fly. Her God was a heavenly Santa Claus. Trouble was, her God doesn't exist. Her God was just a figment of her imagination. Quite different from the God and Father that Jesus reveals. I do not know you says they were shut out how ironic after all that time of waiting after desperately seeking to amend their unreadiness do you even see what they call the bridegroom here sir sir or literally lord lord 
But not everyone who says Lord will enter the kingdom, says Jesus. A solemn warning, you see. It is not enough that you and I have made decisions at evangelistic meetings. It is not enough that you and I have been baptized or confirmed. It's not enough that we've had some experience that we call the filling of the Spirit even. It's not enough that we even call Jesus Lord. We may do all those things and find ourselves excluded. The vital ground of Christian assurance, which this story points us to, is perseverance. Is your lamp burning now? Is it going to go on burning till the end? For it is those who endure to the end are saved. Watch. You do not know the day or the hour. What sort of watching do you think Jesus invites us to engage in? Does watching for his coming mean abandoning all cultural and uh, occupational pursuits? Does it mean going to stand on some mountain somewhere to watch? Some people take that attitude, don't they? They plant no trees in their gardens because, well, Jesus will return before they're full grown. Hardly any point, is there? They take out no insurance policies because, well, they're never going to mature, are they? It's throwing money away. They give up on their education. I mean, it could be no benefit. Instead, they work themselves up sometimes into a kind of hysteria, of fervor, of anticipation. Jesus is coming. Some of them are quite certain they've found, oh, I don't know, communist Russia in the prophecy of Daniel and Chairman Mao in the prophecy of Ezekiel and the Arab-Israeli war is the prelude to Armageddon and so on. The signs are clear, they tell us. Jesus' return will definitely be within the next few years. So we have to restrict ourselves to short-term projects. We have to behave in a way quite different from the way Christians have behaved at any earlier period in church history. For it is now. Whether it be our evangelism or our missionary strategy or our career ambitions or whatever it is. Whatever kind of plan it may be. It's qualified by this imminentist hysteria. Is that the kind of exaggerated sense of watching? that Jesus encourages us in here? I, I think that fails to understand this parable altogether. That's the very reason, you see, Jesus says at the end, watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. We make mistakes in this matter of watching whenever we think we do know the hour. Some people fall into the trap of thinking that Christ's coming is definitely a long way off, or even... Uh, dabbling with the thought that he's not coming at all. And they then, like the foolish virgins, allow their lambs to go out. But there is an opposite error. Some people are so convinced Jesus is coming in the immediate future, they gamble everything on that fact. In both cases, they're watching as those who think they do know the day or the hour. In the one case, it leads to complacency. In the other, it leads to hysteria. That's why, you see, Jesus made the wise virgins sleep. That's why the bridegroom doesn't criticize them when he returns for finding them sleeping. Jesus is not endorsing lethargy there. If you read the next two parables in this chapter, the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats, you'll see that very clearly. The sort of waiting Jesus expects is a waiting which is active, using our talents and which is warned of the dangers of sins of omission inasmuch as you did it not, you did it not to me. No, he wants us to be busy while we wait. But that does not mean we cannot relax. That does not mean we cannot be calm. It does not mean we cannot take rest. Why shouldn't these girls rest? They were ready. Theirs was not the sleep of the negligent. They were confident whenever the bridegroom came, they would be there, whether it was the next hour or the next day. They didn't need to be tense or fidgety 
They were prepared whether the bridegroom's voice came sooner or later. That's the point of the story. They were watching, even in their sleep. But they were watching as those who do not know the day or the hour. They're an example to us of permanent readiness. That's the watch Jesus demands of you and me. A permanently ready vigil. Whether he comes tomorrow, as some people will tell you he's going to, or whether yet again the signs are misinterpreted and it's a long way off. You know, it's interesting, the Apostle Paul likens the unexpectedness and the suddenness of Jesus' return to the arrival of a new baby. He says it's like the uh, labor pains coming upon a pregnant woman. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you'll find that. We do say, don't we, of a woman, uh, she's expecting. I can tell you, I'm married to a midwife. I know well enough that where the birth of infants are concerned, it is all too often when they say, no, it'll be a little while yet. Lo, the midnight cry, behold, I come. (laughs) But doctors and nurses have to be ready, don't they? They can't have time off in the midwifery midwifery wards. For though uh, she was expecting all the time, she did not know the day or the hour. So, as we expect the return of our Savior, where a woman's labor is perhaps imminent only for a week or two, Christ's coming has been imminent from the day he ascended into glory until now. It could be at any time. Like a pregnant woman, we wait as those who do not know the day or the hour. We, We eat, we work, we sleep, we plan but always in the perspective of that climactic moment to come. That's how we Christians are different, you see. In this great torrent of time that sweeps us forward and seems to accelerate, the older we get, the further on into history we get. We know where we're going, and we live with the taste of that future in our mouths. I don't know about you, but I don't think it's possible to live a meaningful human life unless you believe something about the future. To try to live without hopes, like trying to play football without goalposts. You know, you can dribble the ball around with great skill and execute some fine passes, but what's the point if there's no goal? Makes the whole thing a monstrous farce. That's what a lot of people's lives are like, farcical. They're going nowhere, and they know it. Sometimes they try to pretend they're going somewhere, but they know they aren't. So as David Forrow says, they live lives of quiet desperation. Nothing to look backward to with pride, nothing to look forward to with hope. It is so different for the Christian. That's why Christians have resilience when the big crises come. You know, there was a moment in the history of the early church when news broke that completely devastated every single person, far worse than the knowledge of Kennedy's assassination, which most of us who were around at the time can remember just shattering us. This news broke that was a hundred times more devastating than that. It was the news that the Roman Empire had fallen, that the city of Rome had been captured and sacked by barbarians. It was the end of civilization as they'd known it. Augustine, the theologian and pastor, was ministering to his congregations in North Africa when that news broke. He stood up on the Sunday morning after the news arrived and chose as his text a verse from Isaiah 40 that David Jackman was expounding to us at the very beginning of our week. This is what he said. There will be an end to every earthly kingdom. This world is passing away. This world is short of breath. But do not fear. Your youth, he said, pointing to those young Christian congregations, your youth will be renewed like the eagles. 
Augustine spent the remaining 17 years of his life completing his great book on the city which, unlike Rome, can never pass away, Kiwitas Dei, the city of God. That's what gives us Christians resilience. We know where we're going. Our lives have direction and meaning. Not one cup of water given to the least of Jesus' little ones can lose its reward. We can work our guts out for Christ and it counts. We're going somewhere. Don't give up. Watch. Watch. But what of those of us here who are not Christians? Huh? Oh, don't kid me, there are some. Perhaps you wouldn't be here at Word Alive if you didn't have some Christian connections. Somebody's dragged you here. A spouse, perhaps. Your parents, perhaps. Your friends, perhaps. What about you? Isn't there an urgency in this story for you that you really ought to face up to before we go home? William Barclay, in one of his books, tells the story of three devils who were discussing together the best way to tempt and seduce the human race. The first devil suggests, I'll tell them there is no God. Oh no, said the others, that'll never work. You may delude a few that way, but the evidence of God is far too obvious for you to deceive many. Atheism is always a very ephemeral sort of superstition. No one believes it for long. All right, said the second one. I'll tell them there is no hell. Ah, oh, that won't work either, they said. They can't be fooled that way. They know deep down inside of themselves that they are morally accountable. They know it. You'll never get away with that. Their consciences make it too obvious that there will be judgment. Ah, said the third. I have the answer. I'll just tell them there is no hurry. No hurry. You got it, they said. That'll get him all right. Tomorrow is such a dangerous word, isn't it? When, as a child, I laughed and wept, time crept. When, as a youth, I dreamt and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. Later, as I older grew, time flew. Soon I shall find, while traveling on, time gone. Yes, and there's one more line on that clock in Chester Cathedral. A question underneath the poem. Will Christ have saved my soul by then? Let's pray together. Shall we pray? Our Father, you have spoken and we have heard by your Spirit. We pray that we may be ready to make the general universal response you look for from all your people, that we shall be permanently ready, not frantic or fidgety, but expectant and ready and waiting. We pray that you will show us if there are 
particular responses we should make, each of us, whether to set some matter right in our life and conscience, whether to give attention to some new direction for our life that's emerged out of what you've said to us this week, whether to see if there are some new priorities we should install in our minds and lives and timetables, to see whether there are matters in the use of our home and our relationships and our attitudes in and at work, whether indeed, as Roy has reminded us, for some the response should be to bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Help us, we pray, to face out of this morning exactly what we're living for. May none of us here be found living for things that are passing and ephemeral merely of time. Help us to live for things that will last forever for the cause and name and person of your returning Son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.